Hey, everyone, and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com focused on gaining insight from the world's best macro minds. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. We are here with you today to gain insight into the health of the U.S. economy. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews that will help keep you up with the latest investment news. Today, we are here with Alfonso Pecatiello, sorry, I thought I was going to get it, founder and CEO of the Macro Compass. Alf, welcome to public and sorry about the last name. Kyla, it's a pleasure to be here. I saw you tensing up when it was about time to announce my surname. It's really complicated, but hey, you can hear my Italian accent, so it is what it is. It's fine. Pecatiello, Pecatiello. I just was nervous. I just got nervous. Um, perfect. So we're going to get right into it and talk about credit ratings. So as you know, Fitch downgraded the U.S. government from a triple A rating to an AA plus rating. And most of that downgrade was over fears of financial and economic health of the United States. So can you give some more in-depth reasoning behind why Fitch did that? And are those reasons something to consider when investing in government securities? I would like to um, shed some light on why Fitch did it, but to be honest, if you read the report, it's the timing is pretty weird. So basically they said this is due to the fact that the US has a self-imposed restriction, which is called debt ceiling, and the political drama around this debt ceiling is getting a little bit out of control. um, And therefore they basically decide that it is time to take the the, the US out of the AAA rating to AA+. Well, the debt ceiling drama has been going on for, well, since I have memory, to be honest. And I I don't see that as a particular reason why now the US deserves a downgrade. The more interesting part of the report was the analysis of fiscal deficits. So if you take the Congressional Budget Office estimates, they're looking at US debt to GDP to be over 300% in the next decades due to continued deficits. Now, the point uh, to understand there is that U.S. deficits are inject wealth into the private sector. So if you're looking to cut deficits, what you're looking to do is to basically stop or slow down the stimulus coming from the fiscal side into the real economy. So the way you should think, you should think about it is when the United States sends check at home to people in 2021, what they were really doing is they were blowing a hole in their balance sheet because it's the government and its balance sheet doesn't work like mine or yours. The government issues the dollars, is in control of the supply of the dollars, and therefore decides to spend more than it taxes through deficits. Now, the deficit spending is basically the injection of wealth into your bank account. You now have a check that you can cash in, you have money to spend, and you don't have any liabilities attached to this money. You don't have any debt. The government just literally increased the spendable money that you have at your disposal. So fiscal deficits do that. They stimulate the economy. And obviously not all fiscal deficits are good because it depends from the productivity of the spending. But when I hear about let's cut down fiscal spending, let's repay the government debt, what we are doing is reversing the process I just described. We are taxing the private sector more. We are draining resources from the economy. I'm not sure that you want to do this ad infinitum. And so my point is fiscal deficits are not bad per se. It's the productivity and what you do with the newly created injection of money into the private sector that matters. Yeah. Have you seen those frying pan charts on Twitter by any chance? Have you heard of those? <laughs> no, I'm I'm not using Twitter much nowadays, but I can only imagine what it's about. Yeah, well, it's sort of like there was all this lost time during the 2010s because we were, um, especially Europe, was prescribed to that idea of austerity where the government shouldn't spend any money. Um, and the idea now with these frying pan charts is like we could have had this growth level um, and the charts are now catching up to where we could have been if we had spent during the 2010s. But I think you're right. It's really important to be productive with that money. Look, um, I think this is a very interesting point because if I draw a chart of the differential between U.S. fiscal deficits and European fiscal deficits between 2013 and 2019, I can explain with a reasonable uh, precision the difference in GDP growth between the U.S. and Europe in 2013-2019. So basically what I'm saying is, especially the north of Europe, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland, they are pretty much 
allergic to fiscal deficits, really. It comes with their DNA, this austerity standpoint. And they've always um, been very critical of fiscal deficits, also because they have other levers to stimulate the economy. So Germany is, is for example, an export-driven economy. So it can do that through euro. They use a currency, which is the euro, which is arguably weaker than the Deutsche Mark would be for the German fundamentals. And so they can use the weakness of the euro to stimulate their economy, which is export oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, they use private sector debt, the Netherlands, Finland, Austria, Germany, they all use corporate sector debt or household sector debt because they have an easier access to private credit. Italy, Greece, Portugal, they can't really do that. And so they tend to use more the fiscal lever from a government perspective. Now, obviously in Europe, because there are common rules, it's not that easy for Italy, Spain, or Portugal to do that. And so overall, the European fiscal stance has been much more restrictive than the US. And that obviously is basically saying the government's injected less money into the European economy. And it helps, helps explaining why Europe has performed worse than, German, than, than the US. Again, I'm not going to say that we can just spend money and not worry about where the money goes. But this idea that fiscal deficits are bad per se, it's a bit too unnuanced. I think. Yeah, I'm super glad to hear you say that because that does seem to be the big conversation where people are like, well, we can't have any debt. Like the government shouldn't have any debt. And of course, there's a lot of stances that you can take on that. But one of the reasons that we have a government is to spend money on its constituents. Um, and I think, and I'm curious if you agree with this, part of the reason that we've been able to avoid a recession so far is because of fiscal spending, because of the CHIPS Act, because of the IRA, because of the IIGA, all of this policy that the Biden administration has passed. Um, do you yeah. agree with that? I agree with that. I have been wrong in expecting the US economy to perform worse. Your Vibe Session article was great, by the way, when you oh, published you. it. I, I had a lot of fun reading it. And to be honest, there were a lot of recessionary vibes going on. But the, you could make a macro case for uh, the level and the, 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 the pace of tightening uh, in credit conditions and from the Federal Reserve to feed into a much broader weakness in housing markets, for example. And, you know, the housing market is weak, but it isn't collapsing either. And one of the reasons uh, behind, I think, the resilience of the U.S. economy has been that I didn't expect Biden to come up with a one trillion annualized deficit plan, which is what the U.S. has been spending this year. The U.S. is running a fiscal stance, which is even inflation adjusted in line with the great financial crisis. I mean, we don't have any great financial crisis that I see right now. And still, the U.S. has spent over annualized about one trillion dollars into the economy. That helps for sure. Also, because that's fast money creation. Once you spend these dollars and you do manufacturing, um, uh, construction stimulus, you do some social security spending, some tax cuts of some sort, obviously it increases the amount of spendable money for the private sector immediately, while the credit tightening might take a while. If you have locked in a 30-year mortgage, yes, sure, you don't like 30-year mortgages being over 7%, but do you need to refinance now? Do you have urgency to face these refinancing needs and tighter credit conditions, not immediately. It might take a few quarters while the fiscal stimulus happens now. It's not delayed. So I think it helps explaining why. Mm -hmm. And going back to Fitch and the downgrade, because part of the reason that, you, like as you said, Fitch downgraded the United States was because of concerns over this fiscal deficit, because of concerns over you know the debt ceiling, all of the financial stability of the United States. So do you think the downgrade will change the investment landscape in the United States? And what are the potential implications of that? Oh, the de-dollarization question. Oh. Um, <laughs> Oh, it's so scary. Uh, no, I always have a little bit of fun about that um, as a topic in general, because I think I've heard about it since I started working in the industry and it never happens. But you keep hearing it every year, year in, year out. So look, the situation there is that the system we have created is dollar centric. Um, about 70% of the transactions going on in the world, being it invoicing or selling goods or services, are denominated in dollars still today. So when that happens, effectively, you have the entire globe, XUS, that receives dollars in exchange for whatever they're selling, goods, commodities, soybeans, I don't know, something. They get dollars back. And when they do, the dollars enter the Brazilian banking system, the Chinese banking system, and therefore the domestic central bank has the need to recycle these dollars somewhere. 
Now, a candidate is the US Treasury market. Why? It's big, it's deep, it's liquid, it's a huge repo market underlying. There are democratic institutions, there is the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's one alternative. Let's say we don't want to do that anymore because the, the rating is not AAA, it's AA+. Plus. Sure. So what are we going to do? We are going to buy Japanese government bonds. There is no free float. There is no market effectively left. We're going to buy European government bonds. Well, which? Because we have like 19 different bond markets in Europe and only a few of them are rated AAA. And the one that are rated AAA, Germany, they don't want to issue bonds because remember, it's called austerity. So that's not possible. What else are we going to do? We're going to buy Russian bonds, Chinese bonds, Brazilian bonds. I mean, you understand there are some limitations to, basically there are very little good alternatives to treasury markets. And the second thing is, um, I mean, one side is reinvesting these dollars into safe liquid assets. The other is dollar liabilities. There are $12 trillion of debt issued in dollar by entities outside the United States. 12 trillion. So if you want to get away from, let's say, dollar cash flows because you want to de-dollarize, you don't want to sell your commodities for dollars anymore. You want one or Brazilian real or something else. You still have 12 trillion dollar debt to service coupons and principal. So if you don't receive these dollars anymore from global trade because you're selling in renminbi, then how are you going to pay this dollar debt? Of course, you can default on it, but your international credibility is not going to get a boost because you decide to default on dollar debt. So it's a very intricate system where treasuries play a crucial role as collateral, both for asset and for liabilities. And honestly, I don't see an easy way to get out of it. We can get out of it, but it's not going to be an orderly system. And for sure, a credit downgrade from AAA to AA plus is not going to be the reason why we move away from the system. Mm. Did you see that move happening within our lifetime? Or do you think we're pretty dollar centric? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> Very easy answer. Yes, because then I can come back in five years and I can say, well, Kyle, I'm in my lifetime. I hope to live longer than five. So the prediction is still valid. Yeah. No, I mean, it is, it is, uh, it's a, it's a very hard question because if it happens, it happens not linearly. It happens yeah. with, you know, generally with a big geopolitical event or nothing we will be particularly happy about when it's mm -hmm. happening. That's the only thing I can say. For investment purposes, it's very interesting to think about um, shaping a portfolio that can be somehow prepared to this very convex and disruptive event. A 60-40 portfolio isn't. You need yeah. something else. Right. Yeah, and I think that's like been really tough for the investment industry to sort of grapple with is the idea of moving away from a 60-40 portfolio because it that's like what you're taught in school and it doesn't seem like there are a lot of other solutions. So I'm publishing a piece and doing a ton of work on, you know, trying to find a portfolio that is uh, truly diversified. And what I mean is that it does okay in different macro regimes, maybe when emerging markets do better, maybe when inflation comes back, maybe when we doubt about our monetary system. You do this exercise and of course you need to backtest and you know, it has all this downside and upsides, but then you look at it and the biggest sample of this backtest is between, I don't know, 2010s and 2020s. It's one big macro regime, this inflationary growth. And anything you compare to the 60-40 during a US-dominated disinflationary growth environment, I'm sorry, but you're going to underperform. There is no other way around it. And so you can sell the idea, but people have, have this behavioral thing. They are taught in school that 60-40 works. Mm -hmm. They have seen most, they have lived through their investment life by 60-40 smashing everything else. And now you're going to show up and you're going to say, yeah, but you should, you should be prepared as well for emerging markets overperforming or inflationary periods. And they're like, sure, let's do that. They do it for a year, for two, and then they're like, sorry, but you know, it doesn't work. I want my 60, 40 back. And do you think that's because most people don't maybe have like a long-term mindset around investing or is it just the attachment to the idea of what should be right? I would call this a behavioral tracking error problem. And it sounds very sophisticated, but it's not. It's your neighbor getting richer by doing something very simple that you can copy and you're doing something else that in principle is 
more broadly equipped for different macro regimes, but until they play out, you're going to look very stupid by doing that. You're going to look overly complicated without a reason because the macro regime that you're prepared for is not playing out. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a bit of a behavioral issue. It's a bit of a patience issue. I mean, when I ask around, for instance, here in the Netherlands, the housing market has gone up by, I think, 15% a year for eight years in a row. Okay. Mm. So it's just basically house prices have doubled, which means the average Dutch guy that ended up having a house is now rich for no particular skills, let's say, just own the house. It happened to own a house in a good period. Again, this inflationary growth period. So real estate also does well. And when you ask them, what's your investment strategy? They're like, what do you mean? I'm just going to buy houses <laughs> because it worked. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it is in the United States too. Like the bottom 50% of the United States, most of their wealth is in real estate. Like, I don't even think there's maybe, uh, there are some thoughts around investing, but not in the same way. Cause it's just like, oh, I'll get a house. Cause houses always go up in value, um, which is, there's a lot to say about that. But I want to touch on recessions and the Federal Reserve. So you mentioned earlier, you know, that your call on a recession was wrong. As we know, the Federal Reserve has been hiking rates. Um, people are worried about the health of the U.S. economy still. What do you see, you know, the path of the Fed being, especially considering the continued worries over a recession happening? So I think the Federal Reserve has been a bit louder over the last few weeks, interestingly so, not only Powell at, the, at his last press conference, uh, but also Williams now, also mm -hmm. Harker. Um, well, it's not the Fed, but Timmy, so, Timmy, Timmy Rouse, man, I can't pronounce his surname. I told oh, you Nick. That surname. Yeah, Nick from Nick. the Wall Street yes, Journal. Nick. Yeah. Nick from the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. That works. Very familiar. He's not part of the Fed, he's yeah. of the Fed obviously, but he's, he's, you know, editorial uh, way is very, very large when it comes yeah. to the Federal Reserve. They have been effectively uh, singing one joint song, which is, look, if the economy is somehow slowing down, we are seeing, you know, job growth coming back to trend and we are seeing sticky inflation annualizing at two to three percent. So we are getting there pretty quickly now. If you have nominal growth that is trending back down and core inflation that is trending back down and you keep Fed funds at 525, when the economy slows down, by keeping rates that tight, you're effectively adding tightening because you're keeping a tight policy while the economy slows down. Mm -hmm. And so both Williams and Powell and Arker are basically saying, well, if the path ahead for inflation becomes reasonably certain that it converges back to 2% in 2024, we are going to cut. And this is the first time that the Federal Reserve is publicly endorsing the possibility to cut rates in 2024. If you remember, up until a few months ago, we had to basically listen day in, day out, and if had speakers saying market pricing for 2024 is wrong, we are not going to cut rates in 2024. We're going to keep rates higher for longer. This higher for longer story isn't there. I think the Fed is changing a bit their tune, and they understand that previous tightening that has now gone on for well, about what one can say 12 to 14 months of tighter Fed policy, generally speaking, takes time to play out. And now we are in the face of the cycle where historically the lags are more likely to kick in as we go forward. And so there is less need to keep policy this tight. They will try to accompany the slowdown by cutting interest rates, I believe. Not anywhere, yeah, well, closer than um, beginning of 2024. I think they want to, you know, stay tight until the end of 2023. They've communicated that so many times that it would be too much of a shift, I think, and a credibility issue. But come mm -hmm. early 2024, I think the Federal Reserve can start cutting rates if the inflation downturn continues. Mm. And I think that's when Bloomberg is predicting a recession or one of Bloomberg's economic models. Are you also seeing some recessionary fears around early 2024? Well, it's always hard for somebody that does macro strategy and investment that had a recessionary base case that didn't prove right to say, okay, then now but when? everyone was like, wrong. Oh. Everyone. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know. I know. So the, the, the ultimate goal is to try and invest in a way that it doesn't really depend on one outcome. And it, you know, mm -hmm. it has a broad range of outcomes possible. But the way I see it is the latest moves in bond markets have been interesting. You had this bear steepening thing where basically the curve moves well, the rates move higher, but they move higher at the long end. And so that is 
pretty painful because 30-year mortgage rates go up very quickly. Corporate borrowing costs go up very quickly. And, you know, I think when that happens, generally we are pretty late in the cycle because the market says, well, so far the tightening hasn't worked. We haven't seen any recession. Maybe this time is different. Maybe the economy can handle higher interest rates for a much longer period of time. So we're going to put them at the long end of the curve, right? Not only the front end goes up and two-year rates are 5%, but now also the long end. We're going to try and move them up. And when that happens, in the past, generally, it's never different. You are tightening the screws a lot more and generally pretty late in the cycle. And the risk that you end up tightening too much is there. So based on that, again, it seems that right now when the vibe session is less strong as a feeling I feel now, I don't think there are many people left out there that are volunteering to call the recession that quickly anymore. It might actually be the case that we fall into the conditions that we might have one somewhere early next year. Yeah. Wow. Um, It's uh, definitely super hard to predict. And going back to the point of like, everyone was calling for a recession and only recently have the banks sort of let up on that pedal and been like, okay, maybe one isn't coming. Um, But it does seem like an immaculate disinflation happened for sure across the board. Yeah. I mean, so far, Kyle, I think you're right. If you look at the data uh, and you, you know, you would have to judge the Federal Reserve hiking cycle and and, and the tightening and slowing down inflation. And somebody would bring you back in the past and they would say, hey, it's March, 2022. And with the set of information you have in March 2022, I'm going to tell you that the Fed will hike rates by 500 basis points in uh, 14 months, 500 basis points, and it's going to be doing $90 billion a month of QT. What do you think is going to happen in 14 months? I don't think many people will volunteer to say the equity market would be 5% off the highs and vol would be at the lows and you know everything is fine. And growth will be annualizing around one, one and a half percent and inflation is trending down to two. They will be like, what the hell? This is perfect. I mean, this is the best possible outcome. I think the Fed could have dreamt for so far. They're achieving it. They're doing a great job. Now what comes next, it's, I think, a bit more delicate, but it's, it's interesting to hear right now, Powell and Williams, the two heavyweights of the Fed, basically, they start to tell us, hey, guys, uh, maybe we will loosen up a little bit next year just to make sure you don't feel the heat too much. I think it's, it's well-timed, but there are so many other variables. The fiscal side of things. Yeah. Will Biden be able to spend all the, the same pace of fiscal impulse that he had in the beginning of the year? If I'm not mistaken, in October, you guys in the U.S. have a new fiscal year starting, right? It's mm-hmm. October to October, uh, generally speaking. So, you know, you have student loan repayments kicking in and you have uh, the fiscal year just before the elections. I don't know how much political capital can Biden use straight away and get all that fiscal stimulus done as well from October 23 onwards. So you have that fiscal story. You have the lags from previous tightening kicking in. There are a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. And I think so far the Fed has done great, but I'm not sure they can... um, they are not the only determinant, let's say, of what happens over the next 12 months. Yeah, which is tough because they're kind of in charge of controlling all these variables like price stability, maximum employment that have so many other inputs just than uh, just other than what they have. Yeah, it's uh, it's exactly right. I think central bankers are seen as this superpowers, mm-hmm. game masters, and they can figure out everything. But the reality is they have one blunt tool. They have a yeah. big hammer <laughs> called uh, interest rates, and they can you know, be a bit more nuanced, and they can do something on bank reserves and balance sheets and QT. But the reality is it's pretty much of a blunt tool. It's either you hammer or you don't hammer. And everything else that has to do with animal spirits in the private sector. Uh, more structural things like demographics or productivity, fiscal stimulus or fiscal tightening, they have no say on all of this. While all commentators in the world basically attach probably 95% of weight for markets fades ahead to central banks, I think that's a bit overdone as as a percentage allocation to these superpowers game masters. They're important, but there are things they can't control. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like we could keep on talking forever, but I definitely want to respect your time. But this has been the leading indicator, a source of insight from the world's best macro minds. Thanks so much for joining, Alf. Where can people find you and, and continue this conversation uh, um, digitally? My work is on themacrocompass.com. So if you visit the website, you'll find everything I do. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been great.